Welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us on a Wednesday evening um, to listen to um, what I think is going to be a very interesting subject this evening. And thanks very much to Dr. Neil Cable for agreeing to speak. Um, I'm very excited about this topic um, because um, I think we all experienced our battles with the rotator cuff and any any insight will be welcome. Um, just to introduce Dr. Cable, he is an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in shoulders and elbows, um, graduated from WITS and specialized as an orthopedic surgeon in 2006, and then developed his interest in um, upper limbs while he was a consultant at Helen Joseph in Joburg and in 2010 began full-time private practice at the Netcare Linksfield Hospital as part of the upper limb unit. So very um, grateful to have you here this evening. Thanks, Neil. From what I can gather, also a very keen um, endurance athlete <laughs> um, and has experienced his own tendon issue from applauding at the Cape Town Marathon recently. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Um, go ahead and, and start. Yeah, great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity again to talk about a, a subject quite close to my heart and quite passionate about um, in day-to-day -day clinical practice, seeing and obviously mostly shoulder conditions and people receiving all sorts of treatments, including the, the corticosteroid injections that we'll be talking about and focusing on tonight. So I'm going to open up the presentation and just go straight into it. If we have any questions um, about it, please make a note of them and then let's, let's have a, a good robust discussion about it at the end of the talk. If something really is pertinent at the time, just, I don't know, put your hand up on the somehow and let's ask the question, but um, let's, let's get right into it. Okay, so we're talking about cortisone versus the cuff, two heavyweights that are in the same ring and often have to engage each other in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And at the end of the discussion, I hope that we'll be able to see, or well, hopefully you can make up your mind about who wins this bout, the rumble in the jungle. Okay. Um, so who are the contenders in our discussion here? We have cortisone, which is a, actually it's a metabolically inactive substance. Um, it's a 21 carbon steroid hormone, but it gets converted in the body. So mainly in the liver, but also if you inject it into the shoulder under this long named uh, enzyme, gets converted into the active metabolite, which is the cortisol. Mostly when, when we are injecting cortisone into a joint or into the human body, we're speaking about actually hydrocortisone that is the, the active metab metabolite of the cortisone that we are actually injecting into the body. If you take cortisone itself, that then has to get converted into the active hydrocortisone. I prefer to use the nomenclature of hydrocortisone and the abbreviation of an HCI. And I think many of us use that same sort of abbreviation. So in the one corner, we have cortisone or hydrocortisone injections. And then on the other side, we have the contender of the rotator cuff. And I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with this, but just as a nice um, anatomical specimen, and as a reminder, the front of the shoulder with the supraspinatus laying over the top, then the infraspinatus that blends in quite nicely onto the posterior lateral fibers of the supraspinatus. Teres minor, there's not usually a, a discernible gap between the two, but it's a much a smaller tendon and on the front of the shoulder you have your subscapularis tendon with a biceps tendon and tendon groove um, splitting in between supraspinatus and the subscapularis. You're familiar with the rotator interval and then the coracohumeral ligament which is a non-contractile component of the rotator cuff and all of this runs underneath that coracochromial arch which is often the villain in the conditions that we're speaking about in terms of a, a rotator cuff tendinopathy. So 
those are our contenders. And what, are, what is the contest? What are they fighting for? What is the belt, the championship belt that they are facing is the rotator cuff tendinopathy. For many years, this name has been bashed around, it's been changed, and it's been a tendinitis and a tendinosis. And speaking about rotator cuff related pain or subacromial pain syndrome. But for our purposes tonight, let's stick to the nomenclature of a rotator cuff tendinopathy. Um, there's lots of debate in the literature about whether we are talking about a tendinopathy being an inflammatory or a degenerative um, condition. And for a while, it was thought to be mainly inflammatory. So people were giving lots of anti-inflammatory agents and they didn't necessarily uh, get a lot better. So then the the theory was, no, this must be a degenerative thing with alterations in the blood supply and in the vascularity of the tendon leading to these degenerative changes. Um, and now I think we've kind of settled on an in-between that there is definitely an inflammatory component to the condition, which led to these very smart people coming up with what they call the iceberg theory. So if you're operating below a certain threshold in what they call healthy exercise, you're using the cuff within its normal range, normal strength limits. What you do is you establish normal physiological adaptations in that cuff. So you're stretching, the fibroblasts and the proteoglycans are all doing what they were created to do. And your, your cuff has its natural turnover cycles where it would get maybe a little bit stressed and then there'll be an appropriate healing response. Then we progress and if you get a little bit more ambitious in your exercise program and you go into lockdown and you suddenly buy a whole bunch of kettlebells the day before lockdown and then you start overloading your cuff and you start picking up little micro ruptures and all well and well, fine, you're a little bit sore, but I know, like everybody comes and says, ah, I just thought it would heal doctor. And they usually do, but somewhere along this cascade, things can become unregulated and the, the healing can taper off and the other changes, the, the neovascularization and nerve proliferation can start dominating and you land up with a neurogenic inflammation, which then just establishes this vicious cycle of swelling. So the tendon swells and we know that it's in a limited space between the greater tuberosity and the coracochromial arch, a swollen tendon is easier to injure. So you injure the tendon, which then causes a whole bunch of pain um, factors to be released, which then causes more swelling. And then you just get this ongoing vicious cycle of swelling, failure to fully repair. So there's obviously you can see there right away, there's various interventions that we can do to try and suppress the abnormal healing response. And whether it is through physical therapies or just through rest, or do we wanna tackle the, anti -inf the, the, the inflammatory component by giving either anti-inflammatories or a hydrocortisone injection. And we're focusing again tonight on the, the benefits and the burdens of the hydrocortisone injection. So here again, in another diagrammatic form, we have the rotator cuff tendinopathy, which is where this is all going. Okay. The rotator cuff is intrinsically at risk and extrinsically. So intrinsically, we are all subject because we keep going around the sun in laps, They're subject to degenerative and overuse um, conditions with the cuff. So the cuff gets more brittle. We get more apoptotic cells as we age. And as we overstress the tendon, some people, like I, I tell my patients, they come in with, with dodgy collagen. I tell them some people, they, they could run comrades once a month and their knees would be fine and they never have any issues. And there's other people that shouldn't even run around the block because they just don't have all these intrinsic characteristics of their tendons that supports that type of activity. And we can't change this. We, no, mad, no matter how good a physiotherapist you are or the best surgeons in the world, we cannot change this. And so we, we can only change, we can only get involved here on the extrinsic components, which is mechanical. Somebody's got a very curved acromion or got a very unstable scapula. 
and they're actively and dynamically compressing their cuff or they've strained it beyond its tearing threshold or they've got a big bony spur compressing the tendon that those extrinsic mechanisms we can change so we can get them some good rehab and stabilize their scapula and stretch out their capsule and strengthen their tendons wonderful and surgeons we can change the anatomy so if there's a very narrow outlet we can open that outlet and certainly then we can get involved in repairing tendons that have torn when you get a rotator cuff tendinopathy its natural tendency is that it does want to heal and the first phase of any healing process as you well know is inflammatory in nature and that's the first one to three days and then we enter the proliferative stage where there's lots of cells that are moving in and those progenitor cells grow and they form then fibroblasts and then they can differentiate into tenocytes or into cartilage cells or into bone cells and the cortisone as we'll see now affects those first two um, phases of a normal tendon healing response remodeling it is always some effect there but fortunately we can get a lot more effect here on the extrinsic we can actually cause a good remodeling effect through our extrinsic mechanisms particularly with some good kinematics but this is a very intricately linked thing so you can't isolate it at all somebody with a very curved acromion that has an outlet impingement might also have an intrinsically very very weak cuff and so just sorting out their impingement is not necessarily going to give them a javelin throwing cuff and likewise somebody might have a a very sick cuff um, with all these factors against them with a pristine looking shoulder but they've got a very large tear and you try to do a repair and it's just like trying to stitch cotton wool onto a piece of leather and it just doesn't work so we cannot ever say it's just one thing a rotator cuff tendinopathy is always multifactorial from how you chose your parents to what activities you've been doing to previous injuries to diet and smoking and all the rest um, i think Probably the most important thing is that, how you choose your parents. Um, if you choose your parents badly and they gave you dodgy collagen, well, then you're in line for issues throughout your life and not just in your shoulder. If you chose your parents well and they gave you good robust collagen, then you've really got to work hard on the extrinsic factors to cause changes and problems on your rotator cuff. So if we go look again, the cortisone, where does cortisone affect that? So very good article, British Journal of Sports Medicine um, by a well-known shoulder surgeon there as well. They looked at what are the effects, what are the differences between a rotator cuff repair and a corticosteroid injection? And they showed that just by doing a rotator cuff repair, you set off that normal healing response in the tendon. You get um, cell proliferation, you get an increase in vascularity and then all these growth factors and prostacyclins that cause differentiation of those cells to a healing. Whereas a corticosteroid injection has a directly toxic effect on the tenocytes and that's mediated through an increase in the glutamate receptor, the NMDA R1, um, which then causes those tenocytes actually to become deranged and sick and therefore they don't heal. So again, a, another very good article here where they looked at the number of, the, the percentage of apoptotic cells. So what they did was they had um, about 20 patients and some of them had rotator cuff tears and there were some normal shoulders. And then they differentiated the people that had rotator cuff tears into people that had previously had a corticosteroid injection and others that hadn't and the percentage of apoptotic cells in the tendon rupture zone was almost 80 percent in the people that had had a previous steroid injection as opposed to half of that the people that hadn't had a corticosteroid injection and i think that this is a it's more than a correlation i think that there is a direct attribution 
of the effect of the corticosteroids on predisposing somebody to a rotator cuff tear. Our normal cells, normal rotator cuffs also have some apoptotic cells, but it shows you that people that have a rupture, they've got some dodgy collagen, they've got some sick cells, and therefore they are more predisposed to tears. But then you go put some cortisone into them and you dramatically increase the risk. And so not only do you increase the risk of them tearing, but you also decrease their ability to heal that tendon. The minute that tendon tears, it has its maximum healing potential. And by decreasing that by 60, 70%, we really are compromising what we can expect in terms of healing of that rotator cuff. So again, in the pictorial form, the first phases of healing in the first day or two is just all inflammatory. And you get the whole inflammatory cascade mediated by all those prostacyclins, prostaglandins. And then in the, the proliferative phase, that's when the cells migrate into the area and they start growing in size and then differentiating so that they can bridge the gap and actually heal that tendon onto the bone where you put it. And as we mentioned, cortisone has a direct, very potent effect on this anti this infl inflammatory phase. And so if you decrease the initial inflammatory phase in the healing response, you can potentially decrease the overall healing of that. And then certainly to a lesser extent, but also decreasing the, the proliferative phase, the cells that would move into that area become sluggish and lazy and then probably ineffective at causing a good, robust repair. So what are the effects of cortisone at the molecular level? We we've said that they decrease the cell proliferation. Um, they also change not just the cells, but they actually change the chemical structure of the, the collagen and the extracellular matrix. Um, all those pro, um, prostacyclins, prostaglandins, reaching the, affecting the proteoglycan which is the, the matrix of a normal tendon. Um, these things have been shown in, in multiple of the studies that the more cortisone you give them and the shorter the duration of time between doses, you really do increase the risk of tendon compromise. So people that have higher doses and shorter, shorter intervals between their doses their tendons become a lot weaker. So it needs a lot less for them to actually tear. The tendons become less stiff. And we know, I'm talking to the tendon interest group here, we know we want stiff tendons. Stiff tendons work better. Um, golf balls bounce better than squash balls. So we want, we want good stiff tendons, but it makes them actually soft and bubblegummy instead of nice and hard and firm. And then when you do a repair, it's difficult to actually get those sutures to hold anything because the tendon material is actually just not conducive to holding it. So molecular levels, and then histologically, if you go and you look at these tendons that have been injected previously with cortisone, um, that they, they look very ugly and they're flat. And uh, there's a picture coming up now. They look, you can see, I mean, even I can see, and I'm just an orthopod, but you can see how um, irregular they are. And it's interesting that the effect is, again, increased. So the, lower, the, the higher the dose, the longer the duration of the, the changes. And if you're giving them a high dose corticosteroid, those things don't even return to normal for a month afterwards. So again, if you are going to use cortisone, think about dosage keep it as low as possible and then don't give it too frequently and that i must say it's a very common question we get in clinical practice little old ladies with tears who aren't going to have any surgical intervention want to know how often can they come back to get one of those magic injections to help their shoulder pain and i think on average we're saying you know we don't want to give more than three a year so one every four months and that would maybe be consistent, allowing the tendons to kind of settle down and heal um, or, or recover some of their function. So just again, a picture that I just pulled from the internet, looking here at supraspinatus tendon cells. 
that look normal and they've got this striated pattern and they're long and spindly as opposed to the tendon cells that were grown in culture and then treat, exposed to some triamcinolone and they look like fat cells. They're very disorganized and not very, um, you can see that they're not going to work very well and they're not going to hold stitches very well. All right, so again, the effect of cortisone, there is a potent anti-inflammatory effect and we can harness that anti-inflammatory effect to improve the patient's kinematics and anatomy. And what do I mean by anatomy is that it can definitely cause a reduction in the swelling. So a thick swollen tendon isn't as likely to get stuck in a narrowed subacromial space. And therefore, maybe the patient isn't getting as many impingement symptoms so they can move a little bit better. So yes, there is a benef beneficial effect to using cortisone in terms of the, the anti-inflammatory effect. But then also the, the effect on the molecular system, we know it decreases the vascularity, it changes the tendon constitution. Um, it can change the morphology, meaning that it makes them more, more sloppy and therefore less contractile. The genetics, obviously, we can't change. This is what we have to be thinking about all the time whenever we're considering using a corticosteroid. What is the balance? Are we going to be changing the molecular structure too much? so that we compromise the tendon intrinsically, or will we benefit from the anti-inflammatory effect, effect so that the people can actually get some improvement and relief, symptomatic relief, and maybe even cure them. And that's always the, gonna be the, the um, discussion. So this article here in the British Journal of Sports, been excellent, excellent article, um, discussing again, between the concept of is this an inflammatory condition or a degenerative or mixed? And they state quite clearly that cortisone is effective in reducing the pain related to a, ro a sick rotator cuff. And it probably does that by constricting the blood vessels. So therefore you get less nitric oxide um, and therefore you get less pain release because the, the vessels are obviously where the, the pain cells are released from. So, Pain is definitely reduced when you give a corticosteroid. The, we mentioned the swelling is decreased because of that anti-inflammatory effect. And because of those two, you can get an increase in function and somebody may be able to rehab a little bit better. One of the big postulations is that actually what you really are doing is that you're actually relieving pain in that subacromial subdeltoid bursa and not necessarily in the rotator cuff itself. So by ejecting subacromially, you really are setting down that, that bursal pain. And for any of you that have been involved in any sort of rotator cuff surgery, whenever you see a rotator cuff tear, there's always a thick chronic bursitis. And it's red, and you can just see all those synovitic, what I call grapes of wrath, all floating around. And just you can just see the pain just oozing out of them. So maybe giving cortisone will give them some bursal pain relief so we want to use we, we could possibly justify the use of cortisone for these effects but their research shows that in everybody the benefit of cortisone for these things is short term and um, that there's no long-lasting sustained response if you don't change the environment in which that tendon is moving and working there is definitely some benefit to it because it is better than a placebo. But because of all those other intrinsic tendon effects, it is going to risk a long-term compromise on the tendon health. So we've got to be careful about just willy-nilly using hydrocortisone. Um, this was borne out again in the big meta-analysis. And they looked at all the studies that had good data behind them. And again, they showed that there was some transient pain relief, but it was minimal and is only in a small number of patients. So not every patient reproducibly got the benefit of it. It cannot modify the natural course of the disease. All you're doing is you're temporarily, you're pouring water on the volcano. So temporarily you're setting, settling things down, making it less hot. Um, and so that might be sufficient for the patients to get over whatever's bothering them but it can't change a 
an outlet obstruction and it can't change a partial tear. If anything, it can only make it worse. All right, and then also don't forget cortisone injections, they're not the most comfortable thing. There is a cost to them. And yes, we haven't even mentioned the potential risks of introducing infection into the joint, which is going to be a thing if you're going to be wanting to operate and you don't want to get an infection in future. So cortisone, in their opinion, according to their meta-analysis findings, had a limited appeal. And then they asked the question, then why is it still used so much? And habits and maybe just the placebo effect, people saying, oh, look, I've, got, I've had a cortisone injection, now I'm going to get better. And we know the power of the placebo effect. And then this is an important one. I think that when you're getting patient after patient with a sick rotator cuff, it's difficult to keep on telling them, look here, what you need to do is some good rehab, and exp explain the pattern mechanics of the disease so they can understand it and they can be motivated to actually doing proper rehab. It's much easier to just say, okay, what you need is a jab, boom, go for a jab and off you go and we'll see you when you come back again when the effect wears off. Um, I don't know, maybe some people also want some re remuneration for it, but I, I think this is the largest one. It's much easier to have the instant quick fix in our whole society is all about the instant gratification rather than doing the hard work of settling it down, rehabbing it, strengthening the tendons and seeing where we go from there. Um, this is a, a study done here, um, looking just at the subacromial bursitis and they got the stromal cell derived factor one. But basically what they're saying is that in the bursa, they did um, multiple biopsies of the bursa in people with rotator cuff problems. And the stromal derived growth or growth factor causes a big anti-inflammatory response, a big inflammatory response. And if you gave them COX-2 inhibitors, some, some anti-inflammatories or a corticosteroid, it did improve that situation. So maybe, again, putting a bit of cortisone into the bursa can settle down the pain and therefore also decrease that, that um, neurogenic pain that a lot of these patients do present with. And we've gone through this in other forms, but again, the bursal cells are being stimulated by all these factors and then they're releasing this, this um, factor, which then creates a cycle of ongoing inflammation and then this angiogenesis with pain. So their theory is, again, if you can suppress the bursal cells to stop the, um, secreting the stromal factor, that you can potentially reverse the rotator cuff related disease. Um, I, I think that is a little bit wishful thinking because again, it doesn't tackle the anatomy and it doesn't tackle the, um, the intrinsic factors of the rotator cuff. Um, again, another meta-analysis done uh, more recently, a systematic review, looking at what happens after one corticosteroid injection, so a single corticosteroid injection. So they looked at people that had had one injection and then it had a rotator cuff repair. And the risk of having failure of healing or a re-tear was significantly higher for up to a year um, after their surgery. And then we mentioned in the infections that they had a much higher infection rate within a month um, after that rotator cuff repair. So they said, do not use corticosteroids if you want to, for a year before surgery, if you want to get a good healed cuff. And if you don't want to, if you want to decrease the risk of getting infection, don't give any corticosteroids for a month before the surgery. Um, and again, all the adverse, the adverse outcomes, they looked at um, and they said that the, the highest risk period is at six months of um, before surgery. And then don't give more than two injections within the year of the surgery. So again, there's this temporal, meaning that the time period and how much cortisone you're giving. And again, just makes it very, very clear in the literature. Don't use cortisone if you want that tendon to heal and if you want to risk staying away from 
the complications that it can bring. So what are the, the relative indications? Where are some good places where you can and should maybe even think about using cortisone? So when you get those very acute inflammatory tendinopathies, somebody comes in with an acute gout attack, or they've got a, a ruptured calcification in their supraspinatus and it's leaking calcium into the joints, and that sets up an intense, severe inflammatory reaction. And all the strongest opiates and anti-inflammatories don't really change that. Cortisone, very helpful um, in those situations. I'm a bit wary of using um, cortisone for the calcific tendonitis because one of the mechanisms of the calcium actually being resorbed is through that inflammatory process. So suppressing the inflammatory process with a cortisone may actually delay the eventual recovery. But some people are just so, so sore and they literally, they're at casualty three nights in a row because they haven't slept because of this pain. I, I personally had a, I had a tiny little calcification that popped and it was agony. And I can't imagine a big one like this. That must be absolute murder. The second time that we can think about using cortisone is in the, the little old lady. She sits around all day eating toast and drinking tea. She's not looking at throwing javelins. She's not looking at taking her put bulls for a walk. She's very happy to be very sedentary, but she's got shoulder pain. She's got a tear. She's got some impingement. She's not fit for surgery. We're never going to operate on her. I think that it is justifiable to load up with cortisone every now and then. And then it has the added benefit that she loves you then because you've cured her shoulder pain for the next three or four months. And she thinks that you're the bee's knees and she tells all her friends and they all come and see you. And then the last one that we mentioned, if you can give a cortisone, somebody's got a bad shoulder and just enable them just to get over that little hill so that they can do some rehab a little bit better. I think that there is a justifiable use for that, not an indiscriminate use for it, but a very wise, considered approach, explaining to the patients the relative benefits and relative risks for it. So I think that's in, in the whole picture of it. That's the benefits and the pros and cons of cortisone. And you can decide if you're George Foreman or if you're Muhammad Ali, and if you're cortisone or if you're the cuff. I certainly know where I stand, and I hope that we can have some good discussion about that now. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Um, what a great presentation and so clear. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. So I think if we start with those, it'll, it'll kick us off in the right direction. The first one is from Dr. Pele. Um, and he says option of PRP or collagen in these cases with acute on chronic rotator cuff syndrome combined with rehab, uh, that's the question. Um, he says, we haven't collected specific data for study purposes, but clinically these patients improve better than cortisone. Hmm. Okay, so um, PRP is a interesting one. Um, if you look again at the bursa, that we just said is a inflamed thing in somebody who's got a rotator cuff tear. And you go take platelets and you put them into their bursa and platelets are again, they, they're excitatory. So they're gonna cause a healing response. They're gonna cause blood vessel ingrowth. They're gonna cause a fibroblastic response. So I think you've got to be careful about putting PRP into the bursa. Um, there's been lots of work done on PRP perioperatively. So people make little patches of PRP and they implant it into the repair. And the results have been no better than just a normal standard repair. The, the rotator cuff, I think, is different than other tendons. It's not, not I think, it is different from other, than other tendons. Um, it's a very, very broad tendon. It's got a much um, denser uh, cartilage component at the insertion of the tendon onto the bone. And for that reason, I don't think that quarters, are, I mean, PRPs necessarily work. Uh, I, I don't think that collagen is of any benefit. Um, I, I think you're probably going to get more benefit by eating a good beef steak 
and getting those amino acids into your body. There's no way that you can inject collagen into a potential space. And that collagen, which is a big macronuclei, I think, to get that absorbed into a sick tendon, it just can't help. Maybe the collagen has a bit of an anti-inflammatory effect. It absorbs some of the, the particles floating around. But I don't think collagen has any direct effect on tendon health or tendon flexibility or elasticity at all. Okay, that's um, very interesting. I think it's coming through in a couple of questions. So perhaps I can rephrase these questions into one question. Um, and perhaps you could give us a little bit of an explanation of exactly where you are injecting um, into the subacromial space or into the bursa or into the tendon itself, just to get some clarity on that. Yeah. So um, if I'm going to be injecting into a shoulder, obviously you, you're going to be looking at which one you want to be doing. Um, are you injecting into the glenohumeral joint for a particular arthritic um, problem? Or are you injecting up into the subacromial space for a subacromial pain rotator cuff related symptom? If you're injecting into the joint, well, you can go either anteriorly through the rotator interval, or you can go posteriorly um, into the what we call the little soft spot. And that's a fairly easy, predictable one to do, especially if you've you know, if you've done lots of arthroscopy work, you can feel that you can get the needle in quite reproducibly. Into the subacromial space, it can be quite tricky, especially in people that have got a very narrow outlet. And sometimes well, what I usually do is I would look on an ultrasound and see, okay, where's a good spot? And I leave a little mark on it so that when I do go and inject, um, I make sure that I go into the right spot. The, there's been lots of research, again, on this. And it's been shown that even if you just get the cortisone around there, it has an effect. So it doesn't have to be directly into the exact bursa or adjacent to the tendon, tendinopathy, whatever. Um, but and, and cortisone, it, it, you know, when you give a cortisone injection, probably about 20% of it stays locally. But 80% of it spills over and gets absorbed into the, the system. And so you have a systemic effect from it as well. So the local effect is one thing, but I think it's the minor thing. I think there's a bigger spillover into the general um, body. So you get an anti-inflammatory response generally. Okay. So I think that answers a couple of the questions. I'm going to read them anyway in case, in case I'm missing something. The next one is, what is the effect um, if cortisone is injected into a bursa? What are the long-term effects? I think... We have answered that, but if there's anything you'd like to add there, Neil? Yeah, if, if you could give it into the bursa, I, 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 had, a, I had a retrocalcaneal bursitis um, and it was agony. I couldn't wear a shoe, never mind run. And I spoke to my foot and ankle colleagues and they said, oh, just be careful because it's bite by the Achilles and um, cortisone is going to weaken your Achilles, you're going to tear your Achilles. But I couldn't take it anymore. And eventually I injected myself a bit of cortisone and voila it went away and i've never had a problem ever again and i should have done it way earlier and mm -hmm. i think the same thing the same thing can happen in your rotator cuff so if you inject a very swollen painful bursa and it's just the bursa that's giving you the problem you can settle it down and that will be your happiest patient but understand that the bursa is often there because it's being aggravated so there's mm -hmm. an impingement process or there's a a cuff tear that it's trying to heal up and obviously can't. Um, so yes, cortisone can be very beneficial, but it's not a it's not a universal, predictable, definitive outcome. No, but com perhaps combined with rehab once you've settled on that. Oh, absolutely. Pain and so inflammation. There's, there's, there's no point except in the little old duck. If, mm -hmm. you, if you're going to be giving a cortisone injection, so that they therefore can now do some good rehab without hurting themselves. Great. Yeah. Okay. The next question is in the meta-analysis, does mm -hmm. it apply for subacromial injections too? There were a couple of studies that were meta-analysis. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure which one this one so is. All, all those yeah. studies were looking at 
particular for rot rotator cuff tendinopathy and the use of cortisone in them. So yes, the, those studies were relevant for um, rotator cuff specifically, not, not generically. They were rotator cuff specific. Okay, okay great. Um, then there's another question about PRP. Is the improvement best in the rehab and PRP rather than collagen? What does the collagen research show? I think we've answered that one already. Yeah, I don't yeah. know that there's any collagen research. Um, mm. I think it's actually in South Africa, it's actually quite, quite new. Um, but the PRP research has been done on repairs. I don't know of too many people using um, PRPs just in the subacromial space. I see Peter Baxter has just joined the conversation. And I've, I've, we have together we've tried a few patients for PRPs in the rotator cuff syndrome. And Peter will vouch for me here, I hope, that you just don't get the same response that you get elsewhere, that the PRPs don't seem to have the same effect in the rotator cuff as they would for a, a lateral epicondylitis or a whatever. You're welcome to jump in, Peter. Do you have a comment there to add? He's quite a shy guy. <laughs> we'll give him a chance and he can respond later. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree with, with what Neil said. Um, uh, we've had good success with PRP in other areas, but certainly um, around in and around the cuff, uh, very poor results. I think it's so frustrating that the rotator cuff just doesn't behave in any way like any of the other tendons in the body mm. um perhaps one day we'll figure out why and and the fact that your shoulder is a soft tissue joint so your hip is all contained in bone but your shoulder is dependent on that rotator cuff being healthy and strong mm. and therefore mm. if your rotator cuff goes your shoulder function is really affected and yeah so much hinges just on that that cuff yeah, I'm going to move on to the. I'm not sure who Sunny Liston is. Um, oh, he's the he's the boxer. Yeah, so I, uh, okay. I, I stole those pictures from the internet. And oh, see. Sunny Liston okay. was the, the guy. Okay. George Foreman was the Rumble in the Jungle. Yes, in the oh. first picture. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> then, um, regarding the genetic component, would your poor collagen show up in multiple injuries from school age injuries, not just shoulder but multiple joints? Is there a genetic profile one could look for? Or would you advise less strenuous exercise for these? So here's that eternal conundrum of nature versus nurture. So you go look at the Olympic gymnasts. Here you have these teenage and young adult girls who can bend over backwards and can do amazingly acrobatic and energetic things and are super, super strong. And they are extremely flexible and they, their tendons are all rubbery and stretchy and their ligaments and their joints are all rubbery and stretchy and they can get into positions I can only even dream about. And then you see them at 35 and they've got crippling arthritis. So yes, people have, we have different makes up of our collagen and a, a, a rusty old cranky chap like me who can barely touch his knees, never mind his toes when I'm bending forward, my joints are going to be relatively preserved. But somebody who is using their joints at the end of range, they are going to be liable to joint issues, tendon issues, ligament issues, meniscal tears, whatever. And that's going to be relevant throughout all the things. I think there's a spectrum. So on one, one side, you've got the, the typical collagen vascular disorder so your, your ehlers danlos syndrome and the other side you've got somebody who's very 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 tight and all of us are somewhere along in that spectrum so young people that are very flexible and stuff they they naturally are better sportsmen they can generate much higher velocities in throwing and they can be more accurate and stronger and somebody who's got big strong muscles and they can lift massive weights but they've got thin little tendons, those tendons are going to be under load. Mm. Um, I don't know that we can go and at this stage quantify that and say, okay, you've got 
this type of collagen and this type of collagen, so therefore you shouldn't do this and this and this. But I mean, I see it clinically every day. Some guys come in and they start listing the things that they've had. They've now torn their cuff, they've done a distal biceps, they've torn their hamstrings, they've done an ACL, they've done their ankle ligaments and they've snapped their Achilles all on the same side, mm -hmm. you know? So yes, there are, there are people that are predisposed to collagen disorders and tendon issues. Um, and it takes, it takes something for them to realize, hey, I mustn't be so abusive to my body. I, I can't handle it. I, th I think it's also up to us to recognize those people when they come into our practices and advise them accordingly, because the, the young girl who's very flexible is going to choose ballet because she'll, yep. be, she'll be good at that. Um, mm -hmm. But then we'll end up with problems later because of her flexibility. And she's got to work really hard to make sure her muscles are strong, strong, strong. strong and she's mm -hmm. not, you know, bending too much. And yeah, mm -hmm. otherwise they are going to get to middle age and to be crippled. They, yeah, they do before middle age even. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the next question is, what are your thoughts of nitroglycerin patches on rehabilitation and tendon healing? So I haven't had any personal exposure or use of them. What they are theoretically doing is decreasing the nitric oxide that's available in the tissues. Um, and therefore, the same effect as the cortisone will decrease the vascularity and then the release of substance P and all those other prostacyclins. So potentially, I don't know how you can get a, a effect by sticking a nitroglycerin patch on a big deltoid and hoping that that's going to go through the deltoid, through the bursa and into the rotator cuff. Um, so I don't know about the use for it in that type of context. Maybe if you've got a superficial tendonitis, um, like your, your, your extensor copy radialis, maybe then, yeah, maybe it could be effective like a, like a transat patch. But I don't have any personal experience with nitroglycerin patches. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, Tom, I'm gonna skip your question. Um, just wanna ask the next one first, consideration of prototherapy and in brackets, it says 50% dextrose. And the question is, what are your feelings about that? <laughs> That's a loaded question because mm -hmm. I, know this, I know this doctor likes prolotherapy. Um, there is, again, there is, depending on what research you read, there is some evidence to support that. On what basis does it work, though? We, I don't know. Is it, is it just that you're just distending the joint and you're giving it a little bit more space, that you're separating any um, adhesions between bursa and cuff and even between bursa and the acromion? So I don't know what the, the science behind it is. I do think that there is a, a, a very strong placebo effect. And I do think that there is a very strong, what's it called, an, an intention to treat. That if you go along to somebody and say, hey, I'm going to make you better with this injection, I think some people do respond and they do get better. But I don't know that just the dextrose and the, the fluid into that area um, changes molecular structures or anything in the long term. I'm not particular au okay with it. Okay. And I'm going to go back to Tom's question, um, asking what your view is on injecting for adhesive capsulitis. So I think in the, in the early phase, in the freezing stage, it can be very useful. Um, you can maybe decrease the whole duration of the condition and the severity of the condition. Um, once they are frozen, though, the cortisone can only have a temporary effect. I've, I mean, I've, I've used it multiple times. And at most, the people will get two weeks of relief. And then you've got to think about what you're doing there. You, you're taking a very, very sore shoulder. You're putting in some cortisone, which itself is a bit of a painful injection, especially in a frozen shoulder. And then what do you do then? There are some surgeons that use a protocol where they inject cortisone in the frozen stage. They inject cortisone and then they subject those patients to very intensive physiotherapy with deliberate stretching, like three times a day of very forceful stretching. And the theory is that we're gonna, we're gonna try and stretch the shoulder open now 
Um, and the, the cortisone is there to relieve the pain that's going to come from the stretching. I tried that on two or three patients and got very iffy results. Maybe I wasn't following the protocol well. Um, and and I, I now tell patients, look, we can give it to you, but you really are just giving you a bit of temporary relief, partial relief, and it's not a sustainable long-term thing. And maybe even might complicate things. And then don't forget a lot of frozen shoulders, 40% of frozen shoulders are diabetics. And you give a diabetic cortisone, you push the sugars way out of whack and mm -hmm. it's, it can be dangerous. So if I'm understanding you correctly, you've got to send them early when they're in the pain phase of the Yeah, and the, the, patient has, the patient has to, to realize it. Usually the only ones that I get early are people that have had one on the other side. So they've had a capsulitis on the other shoulder and then they say, oh, I think it's happening here. And their cortisone can be useful. Not always, but they can still go on to developing a, a very stiff frozen shoulder. Um, when, when we inject the frozen shoulder, I see there's a question there. Yeah. Um, I, I try and inject into the rotator interval because we know it's that rotator interval and that coracohumeral ligament complex where this thing tends to arise. So if you can get in there, and very often, if you're looking on ultrasound and you see that rotate interval and you put the needle in, as you go into it, the patient will have this very sharp pain. That, oh, yes, that's the spot. So try get it into the rotator interval. Then some of it will go into the joint and then some of it will go into that surrounding subacromial space. Um, in people that, that are in a frozen stage, then I would just go subacromial. And it's amazing how when you get into that subacromial space, on the, on the rare occasion that we do a surgical release of a frozen shoulder, you get up into that subacromial space and you see just as much inflammation and angriness up top as you do inside the joint. Mm -hmm. So it can be useful subacromially as well. Okay, there's a, a follow-on question there. Um, what's your experience with toradol injections versus cortisone, especially in diabetics? where the cortisone yep. may raise the blood sugar level. Certainly, I've used them once or twice in, in diabetics for exactly for that reason, and the results are the same. Whenever I give a cortisone injection, which, as you can gather from this evening's talk, is not that often, mm -hmm. but and whenever I do give a cortisone injection, I tell the people very categorically, this thing might do absolutely nothing for you except give you pain from the injection, or it might give you full permanent relief and anything in between and i can't look at an x-ray on an ultrasound or some other test and say you are going to get good response or you're not going to get good response we just don't know so the same thing for the people having toradol tell them the same thing this might give you some very good relief for people that don't know toradol is just a it's an injectable anti-inflammatory um, so this might give you very good relief the literature um, I've read a lot of studies that say that it's as effective as cortisone. And maybe it's, maybe it's even better that you don't get all those long-term negative side effects that you do from the corticosteroid. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's worth considering doing that more often. Okay. I'm just going to go back up to a little bit higher. Um, John has made a comment supporting um, what you said, that there have been at least four genetic polymorphisms identified predisposing to suboptimal collagen and recurrent tendon and ligament injuries. Some of this work done in SA, which is fabulous. I would like to ask a question, and it might be too soon to answer this question, but just to throw it out to the group. I feel like I'm seeing more irritated tendons and nerves, peripheral nerves, in patients who've had COVID. Hmm. And I'm not sure if that's just me or if there is a general feeling in the group that perhaps there's a pattern starting to emerge. I, I concur. I think that, that COVID is very neurotoxic. And that's mm. why you know, a lot of people lose their smell because that mm. affects the factory nerves directly. And, and there's been a number of cases of vestibular problems and sudden deafness from COVID. So there's definitely a neural effect, for sure. 
Um, another question from Dr. Pillay, and I think the answer is going to be similar to previous answers about saline dilatation for adhesive capsulitis. I'm assuming that it would perhaps have the same effect, just creating space, separating. So, so that's a slightly um, different thing because then you, you're injecting into the glenohumeral joint and you're putting in a big volume of fluid. So like 40, 45 mils of fluid to try and distend the capsule. Uh, I know some local surgeons also have tried that. Um, I, I'm not a big fan. Um, and again, just from, just from seeing a handful of cases, so anecdotal evidence that people did not respond as well as we would, would have liked them to have responded. So frozen shoulder, I mean, I see ad nauseum frozen shoulder. I see maybe four or five patients a week with frozen shoulder. And the stories that I tell them is always the same. This condition is going to get better. And you don't have to do anything to it and it will get better. And you can go to the shop. They, they sell at spa. They sell these very special tablets. They're called SMRTs. They come in all <laughs> different colors. And you take three or four of those a day. And by the time the box is finished, your shoulder will probably be much better. And so if you can just tie them over. And so often, if people just know that they don't have cancer and they're not dying, that they can get through this and they can, they can let their shoulder recover spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Or the people that come in and they say, so I haven't slept for three weeks and I'm going to strangle somebody and I'm miserable and I can't work and I need to do something, then I think a controlled arthroscopic release of the capsulitis is the way to go. Um, I avoid those manipulations. I avoid those injections and stuff. Again, I, I don't want to be injecting big volumes of fluid into a joint that's very stiff and sore and potentially introducing infections and all the rest. Mm -hmm. if, it, if, they, if you're going to go to the length of doing an intervention in the theater, just do a scope. Um, I have one more question, Neil. Could you give us an idea of when you're starting to think surgery for these rotator cuffs? What are your um, criteria or your guidelines for recommending surgery? Okay, so I mean, I don't have to think far. So today I saw a 73-year-old lady from Paris, and she is an avid tennis player. And she hurt her shoulder in an overhead serve in August. And she hasn't been able to play tennis since. And she came in for assessment and she's got a partial width, full thickness supraspinatus tear. And I explained to her that this, this can't heal. They can settle down. Um, they can become asymptomatic in terms of no pain, maybe a little bit of weakness but they can stabilize and settle down. I can't look at an ultrasound or an x-ray and tell you that yours will, but it might settle down. Her husband had a very similar injury last year, almost exactly a year ago, and he had surgery. And he is trying to push his wife and to say, you need to go and have surgery because my, look at my shoulder, my shoulder's fine. And she's sitting there and she's saying, but I don't need to. I don't have to play tennis. And if I do, I just do a double-handed backhand and then I'm, I'm fine. So it's, it's horses for courses. So the younger the person, the more inclined I am to recommend surgery. The bigger the tear in the younger person, obviously the more inclined I am to recommend surgery. Um, in people that have a stable shoulder and they've got minimal clinical effects so they don't have a drop arm and they can they're not hiking their shoulder every time they try and lift up their arm and you really have to look hard to see the tear give them the option and say look here this is up to you my job is to try and explain to everybody what the predictable natural history is we know that at least 50 percent of tears and if you're younger 80 percent of tears will progress Unfortunately, the ones that progress are the ones that are painful. Um, we don't, we, we, when we're repairing a cuff, we're not restoring necessarily that 
single muscle tendon function. We are creating a capsule that's depressing the humerus. And I still think that mainly then your deltoid is actually moving your shoulder. So you don't need a supraspinatus tendon to live. But you do need it if you want to be dynamic overhead and if you want to have fatigue resistance. So younger people who are doing overhead activities, who are overhead athletes, fix the cuff, suck up the six months of rehab and recovery. Older people, leave it up to them completely. Subscap tears, fix. Um, rare to see isolated infraspinatus tears, but if they do happen, fix, because to have a torn infraspinatus is very disabling. You can't get your hand to your mouth and, and basic stuff. Okay, great. Um, are there any other questions from from the group? You can you can unmute yourself if you'd like to, or type in the chat. I'm just going to put my um, cell phone number in the chat. We do have a Tendon WhatsApp group, so if you'd like to be added to that group, I can just remember my phone phone number. Um, then just pop me a message and I'll send you the link to join the, the WhatsApp group. Um, we'll, we'll put any future um, interesting articles and, and future talks onto that group. So just pop me a message. And then if there aren't any further questions, I'd really like to say a huge thank you. That was a very, very informative um, talk, Neil, um, and answered many, many of our questions um, and we're really grateful that you took the time to to be here this evening thank you so much great pleasure anytime enjoy the enjoy the forum thank you <laughs>